Happy Easter, everyone. And uh, I know some of you didn't realize you're getting the VIP seating today. <laughs> I am so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. I'm going to try not to spit too much or call on you either. That's everyone's fear, I think. Like someone's, he's going to call on me or he's going to look at me. I'll try not to look at you. So, man, what a blessing to be worshiping together this Easter. And really, the culmination of our sermon series, and don't worry, it doesn't matter if you heard any of them up until now, but we've been looking at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life and really just trying to slow down and say, like, we know the story, it's become so familiar to us, but in what ways can we rediscover the story to rediscover faith in our own lives? And I hope that that's what this has done for you. If you haven't heard or you're new here or grandma dragged you here today, there's a, there's a book by Adam Hamilton called 24 Hours That Changed the World. It's a great book. And uh, it's really the conversation of this sermon series. But today is all about Easter. And as we dive in, I was thinking about something that happened now, gosh, almost we're getting close to two years ago. Something that changed the scientific community forever. And I'll just say this, I'm not anti-science, I love science, but I find it really fascinating what's going on when it comes to cosmology, when it comes to the universe. So back in 2022, July, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched and was sending, well actually it was launched before then, it started sending back images of the universe. And the images coming back, I don't know if you've seen any of them, they are unbelievably spectacular. It's like this deep, deep look into the universe. And now what used to look like a little blurred out blip in the sky is a galaxy. I mean, it's that kind of mind-bending stuff. And we talked about this right when it happened because there, there was immediate response from the scientific community. So as reported in Relevant Magazine, said the models, this is a scientist in Southern California, said the models just don't predict this. Basically, what they're seeing didn't match up what they thought they knew. How do you form so many stars so quickly? We thought the early universe was this chaotic place, but that just doesn't seem to be the case. This means a certain amount of reevaluation is in order, but that's the nature of science. Scientists are used to hypotheses falling apart under the weight of new data. I was sort of checking in, okay, well, we know that was the initial response. How's it been going lately? So I looked back at an article from this last December. They kind of said the same thing. From what existing theories and models tell us, the galaxies that the James Webb Space Telescope found are too big, and the mature red stars in them too old. This creates problems for science. It calls the whole picture of early galaxy formation into question. Fascinating, right? The things that they're able to see, as it turns out, they just didn't have a powerful enough lens to see it. Things that were taught to me as dead certain truth when I was growing up, they're changing, well, I was going to say they're changing the textbooks, they don't even use textbooks anymore. They're, they're changing the information to teach the next generation about what they're now discovering in space. And I got a lot of questions. I got a lot of questions about the science, but it's a mystery. No matter how many different ways we spin it, it is a mystery. And when God said this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. I look back at that time in scripture as to say, God didn't go through the mechanics of how he created the universe. How many volumes would that have been? well, I took subatomic particles, and I, like, what? Like, no, that's, because that's not the part that mattered most to God. What matters most to God is the why, is the relationship. I created the heavens and the earth for you. Out of his great love, he didn't need to create anything. God would have been fine just by himself. But out of his great love for us, he created the heavens and the earth. What does this have to do with anything? Well, I think this has to do a bit in a similar way with the resurrection. 
The resurrection, there's a mystery to it. I can't sit here and unpack for you mechanically. This is what Jesus did day one, day two, day three, and this is how it all worked out. I could tell you theologically what happened, but I wasn't there. I'm not Jesus. Some of these things are just kind of best guesses, but not when it comes to the verifiable fact that God so loved the world, he gave his only son for you. It's a relationship reason that we care about the resurrection, even though the mechanics may be a little fuzzy. So let's go through, as we've been going through and unpacking each part of the last 24 hours of Jesus, you ever wonder, so he's crucified, and three days later, later he rises again. What was going on during that time? What was going on for those three days? What was happening? Some of the answers we know pretty certainly, and others we have no clue. We have best guesses. So here's what's going on. Day one, Jesus died after six hours. He was hanging for six hours on the cross, according to Mark's gospel, which interestingly was a short, considered a short amount of time. I know, I can't even get my head around it. In fact, Pilate was a little bit surprised that he had already died. And I think that speaks a bit to the level of torture that they inflicted on him before he was crucified. And there was something playing, there was a sense of urgency happening because the Sabbath was about to start that evening. At sunset, Sabbath begins, and that was the Passover Sabbath, a very important one. Sabbath would begin, and once you hit Sabbath, you weren't allowed to bury any bodies. You weren't allowed to do anything. In fact, if there's anybody still hanging on a cross, you had to leave them there. And they're a little bit of a race against the clock. Jesus dies, they have about three hours for the burial, which is not enough time to do all the things that they would do according to custom with burial spices and preparing the body and all that. So they had to hurry up and make a way. And the Jewish authorities then petitioned Pilate because they didn't want the bodies hanging during Sabbath. And so they they asked Pilate to do what he would normally do. And I know this is really brutal, but death by crucifixion is death by suffocation. As soon as you can't hold yourself up anymore to breathe, you, you die. And what he would do, or what they would do to speed it up, is they would break the prisoner's legs so that they couldn't hold themselves up anymore. Horrible, I know. But that, that was the request, so that the bodies weren't there during the Sabbath. Now, somebody emerges on this day, sort of surprisingly, kind of out of nowhere, Joseph of Arimathea. We know a few things about him. Mark says he was a respected member, member of the council. What council? The Jewish council that, that ended up uh, persecuting Jesus and sentencing him to death. That same Jewish council, he was a part of it. And I got all sorts of questions, like where was he when everything was going down? And it makes me think that maybe it was a little more complicated than than we initially thought. Maybe there were some people like Joseph of Arimathea who believed in Jesus but were too afraid to say anything. And it's at that moment that I see a little Joseph of Arimathea in my own life. When have I been in situations when I could have said something about faith, about Jesus, and I decided not to. I decided to, um, you know, I didn't want to take the heat or whatever. And then afterwards, and of course I regret it and think about, oh, I should have said this, I should have said this. You ever have that happen? Like, oh man, I would have said that perfectly. Or maybe Joseph of Marimathea came to faith in the process of Jesus dying. I don't know. But he was somebody apparently who had some money and he purchased a tomb and carried Jesus to the tomb to bury him. Without all of the preparations, but to lay him in it, And of course, as we know, they rolled the rock of the tomb to seal the body off. They especially, and the whole reason, like, they put a Roman guard out there, they normally wouldn't, but they had heard the rumors that he was said to rise again, and the Roman Empire was like, no, he won't. (laughs) You know, like, we're gonna be watching, so that, so, or, or not just he won't rise again, but that the disciples won't come and take the body, or something like that. So Jesus is buried without preparation. Okay, day two. What happens day two? Holy Saturday. The answer is... I kind of don't know. We have some ideas, but they're really just that. We don't know the mechanics of the quantum physics of the thing. 
But we do know some things. So, interestingly, if you know the Apostles' Creed, the Creed tells you he descended into hell. The harrowing of hell, as they call it in tradition, on Saturday. And the idea was that Jesus pays the price of all of our sins by descending into hell so that we won't have to, and literally unloads sin and death while he's in hell. Some say that's where he actually conquers Satan. There's an obscure passage in 1 Peter that talks about him going to preach to lost souls. Perhaps, and I love this idea if it's true, perhaps he went into hell and preached the good news that death had not won. But the answer is, I don't know. We don't know the mechanics of the thing. But here's what I can tell you with some degree of certainty. I'll bet you that that day too was the toughest day for the disciples. It's like when you go through any sort of tragedy. Maybe you lose a loved one or maybe you go through just this impossible circumstance in your life or relationship falling out or whatever it is. Almost the next day is almost worse than the first day. First day is like all adrenaline. And then the second day, reality starts to set in. And I wonder what kind of reality was setting in for these disciples. I could imagine a lot of things. One is, why didn't I speak up? Why didn't I say anything? I said I'd be with him to the death. I didn't even make it to to his trial. I ran. What could I have done? What could I have said? Or maybe it was something like, Hey, I thought Jesus was the one. We were on team Jesus and we were winning. And then they crucified him. And now he's dead. What does that mean? It means I was wrong. It means he was wrong. It means I shouldn't have put my faith in this guy. I wasted three years of my life, some of them, following this guy. And now, what am I going to do? I thought we were going to overthrow the government and have this whole new reality, but now I got to go back to fishing. I don't even know where my nets are. I haven't been home in a while. (laughs) Thinking about the reality of their life setting in and the tragic disappointment and then just losing Jesus, whom they loved. In a way, they were harrowing hell themselves on that day, perhaps. And then we get to sunrise on the third day. Here's Mark's account, Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. I love the English translation of that. They were alarmed. (laughs) (laughs) What? I I don't know. Uh, Maybe I'm just different, but alarmed, yes, alarmed. Don't be alarmed. He said, you are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. A couple of things going on there. First of all, I love the shout out to Peter. Peter, who very publicly denies him. Talk about guilt and shame. What do you think Peter was going through? Knowing they did that. Watching that he's crucified. Knowing everything that went down. What do you think he was feeling? And in fact, I think it's also, go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter may not even be with the disciples anymore. He probably doesn't even consider himself part of that group. Go tell the disciples and Peter. He's still in on this. I still got plans for that guy. His story hasn't finished. And then you're going to see Jesus just as he told you. By the way, he told you so on the resurrection. 
So you can trust. He says he's going to go to Galilee, as he told you, to show up there. What hope? Can you imagine the hope that they were feeling? And the crazy mix of emotions. This is the wild thing, is that the people most surprised, seemingly, by the resurrection are his own disciples. They had no idea. Like, clearly, no idea. You'll see the women's reaction. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's how Mark's gospel ends. That is not, and they were happily ever after. Like, I don't know, if I were inventing a religion, let's say, I would have come up with a little better ending, a little more drama. Maybe I put myself in there as like a likable guy that maybe does the right thing. They didn't say anything, they were afraid. This rings true to me because they had no clue what the heck was going on. And this is the thing about the resurrection. We get four different gospels with four different accounts of what happens. There's a mystery to it. There's all sorts of different details. Are there two angels? Is there one angel? In another account, Jesus, the risen Jesus, is there. Some disciples go to the tomb. Sometimes it's the women first. Sometimes, like, or, or the disciples find out, and a couple of them come running to the tomb. Why is it all different? I, a couple of things. First of all, it's a mystery. Second of all, doesn't this ring true to you? Here's what I mean. When I, my kids were at the earlier service, this is okay. When I was a teenager and I came up with, let's say, a really good lie to my parents and, and my friends ran on the lie, what did I have to do? I had to make sure that they all got their story straight before we went to the parents. No, just me? Yeah, everyone's got to corroborate. Everyone's got to get the story straight before we go to the parents. Or else they're going to discover it's a lie. Listen, if none of this really happened, I would think that they would get everybody together and be like, okay, what's our ending? What's the story? Let's get our story straight before we go tell the world. So that we're all on the same page. No, this feels like four different reactions to this thing they couldn't explain. And people are recalling different things in the emotion of it all. Think about 9-11 for all of us. If we were to get four of us together and like recount everything that happened in exact detail, all of our stories would be different. But it would have some common points. And the most important thing is the thing itself. It happened. The most important thing was that tomb was empty. No matter which account you read, even though you don't get the quantum physics of it, maybe it's a little bit fuzzy, what you do know is the tomb was empty and that changes everything. So yeah, the resurrection, it takes faith, but not exactly blind faith. There's enough evidence for us to say, wait a minute, that's a logical conclusion. <laughs> because I can't think of another reason. And not for lack of trying, certainly. But the fundamental Words of the angel, he has risen, he is not here, is the thing, it's the whole reason I'm a Christian. I'm not a Christian because of the teachings of Jesus. I'm not. I'm not a Christian because of the miracles of Jesus either. I'm a Christian because the tomb is empty. And that changes everything. And so I pay attention to the miracles and I listen to the teaching. I say this every year, but it's just a quick reminder of what are the three top reasons skeptics believe that Jesus did not rise from the grave? These are their best answers. Top three. Here we go. First one, wrong tomb theory. The women were so upset, they accidentally went to the wrong tomb, and it was empty, and they see an angel in there, I guess. I, who was that guy? <laughs> um, First of all, that's dumb because they were just there. They were there uh, before when, they, when he was buried. So they knew exactly where it was. And I don't think they'd forget where the Lord was placed. And what a terribly low view of women. <laughs> like, oh, they were all up in their emotions and they couldn't find the... That's, what, are, what are you talking about? That's the most ridiculous thing. Of course they knew where it was. That's stupid. Okay, anyway. That's number one. That's the most popular. Number two... 
The disciples lied. Okay, fine. Let's say they lied. Help me understand how it ends. All but one of them was martyred, believing that Jesus rose from the dead. Is that worth the lie? Does that make any sense to you? At some point, before it leads to getting stoned to death or crucified upside down, I think you would say, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I, I, we took this a little too far. Or that, and the third is, well, Jesus never died. He was only mostly dead. Like, <laughs> Princess Bride fans, anyone? Okay, it's, it's a generational miss, I think. But anyway, yeah, that, that he somehow, he wasn't dead, and somehow he managed to pop back up and go and see people, although I really don't explain how doubting Thomas is able to touch his wounds. I mean, he, he would have been bleeding out, I would think. Anyway, there's him appearing to different disciples in different ways, seeming to come and go between walls. I don't know that trick, but maybe again, if he did that, I still want to listen to what he has to say, because that would be pretty special. Honestly, if, when you just start looking at the evidence, it becomes overwhelming, right? Disciples are martyred. There's no body produced. The Roman Empire, don't you think they would have loved to say, nope, he didn't rise again, he's right here. Yes. They didn't want people thinking this guy rose from the dead. Are you crazy? <laughs> they did not want that. Caesar is Lord, in their opinion. And then there were just all the eyewitness accounts of seeing the risen Jesus after. Then there's the worldwide impact of Jesus. Just think about it that way. For example, Google Books. It has the titles of like every country, author, and publisher. And the second most... This was surprising to me. The second most number of titles in history is George Washington. I didn't know, I didn't know he'd be number two. 58.4 million titles about George Washington. He's second. And of course, number one, Jesus at 109 million. Almost twice. And then he just had the most cultural impact of anyone in human history. It touches every single field. Art, architecture, music, education, medicine, everything, all touched by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And there's not just that sort of evidence, but there's the evidence of the transformed life. Something changed those, dis those disciples who were afraid for their own lives and turned them into bold proclaimers of the good news that Jesus rose again. I find it hard to believe they just all got together and be like, you know what? Enough stinking thinking. Let's get out there and let's get after it. <laughs> Remember your why. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't think it was just like we, we pulled it together and we, we just got better. And, you know, Tony Robbins came and gave us a pep talk and we, <laughs> we hit it hard, you know? Something transformed them, but even more than that, something has transformed your life, my life. I can't explain it. I can't explain what happened when I was lost and then I was found. My life before Jesus and then with Jesus, I, I, there's no other explanation to me. When I put my faith in him, it changed everything almost instantaneously. I had one of those stories. And then, what does that do for our hope of life after death? Jesus calls out and said, I rose again, so you can have hope that you're going to rise again. You will be with me. There's a wonderful book, and I'd encourage you to get it, because it's just a great read. Um, Imagine Heaven. This is a book by John Burke, and he writes about thousands of near-death experiences. He was a pastor, and then he went, to, he went to research this. He went down this rabbit hole to research this. And they had thousands of near-death experiences from people of all walks of life. But he specifically focused on people who had nothing to gain by sharing their story. So he picked people that were fairly well off. And he picked doctors, lawyers, professors, like people who had, they, they were going to try to sell their story. Even, and this is wild, even blind people who had never seen a day of their life claimed to have actually seen the same visions and had an experience, a shared experience, 
that they believe was Jesus, all from different ages, cultures, everything, that science cannot explain. It is a, it's a fascinating book. But we don't even need a book like that to believe Jesus tells us, right? What does Jesus say? Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Or for them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. In other words, forgiven, made clean so that they can be with me. What's Jesus say? My father's house has many rooms. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. This is the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's resurrection. It's resurrection right now in our very hearts. New life. Taking our hearts of stone and turning them into hearts of flesh. And then this heart for God, this relationship with God, would go on and on for an eternity. Being in his presence. That that's what he did for us out of his great love. What if... The reason the resurrection, maybe you feel, hasn't changed your life is because you're looking through an insufficient lens. Maybe you need a spiritual James Webb telescope. Maybe you need the right lens so that you could see things for what they really are. Jesus, God made flesh, came here to set you free, to forgive your sins to give you life and that to the full forever. Jesus is alive and it changes everything about right now. After all, a new lens can change everything. And here's the point. Like God made the heavens and the earth. We don't know all the mechanics of it. That tomb was empty. We don't know all the mechanics of it, but we know the why. The why is Jesus didn't just die and rise again. He died and rose again for you. Just as you are. So that you might live. Jesus is alive and that changes everything about today. It was 24 hours that changed the world. Has it changed yours yet? Because I think the biggest shame that could possibly happen is for you to walk out those doors and not know what he's done for you and how that changes everything. Amen.